So picture this, you're a kid in search of adventure in a brand new land. On your travels, you meet a friendly girl on a ranch who you immediately hit it off with. She warns you of an ominous threat from the unknown. Strange beings that appear in the night. That they come for the cows. She tells you that this year, she's going to try and stop them. She tells you to meet her in the barn later that night. Her stories seem a bit paranoid and perhaps even delusional. That is... Until they appear in the night, just like she said they would. Pinching closer and closer. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Grim Gallery. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is my personal favorite in the series. It's drenched in a noticeably darker setting amongst some pretty colorful characters and is packed full of creepy elements. One such quest takes place on Romani Ranch, where you have to help Romani, that's the girl, defend her farm against aliens or ghosts. Doesn't seem to be a solid conclusion on that one. Suffice it to say, she refers to the phenomenon as them. They are characterized by their two glowing eyes, thin arms, and long claws, slowly levitating towards the barn. If you fail to help, they abduct the cows and Romani herself, returning her a day later with no memory of what transpired and with a noticeably different personality. With the creepy ambiance set on by the music that plays introducing these mysterious creatures, the encounter in itself is bone-chilling enough, but what's truly unsettling is what they were inspired by in real life. At 7.15 p.m. on September 12, 1952, a group of kids in West Virginia, Edward and Fred May, and their friend Tommy Heyer, aged 13, 12, and 10 respectively, witnessed a bright object cross the sky, coming to rest on land belonging to a local farmer, G. Bailey Fisher. They ran home to tell their mother that they had seen a UFO crash in the hills nearby. Together, the mother, the neighborhood children, Eugene Lemon, a state national guardsman, and his dog traveled to the Fisher farm to investigate what the boys had claimed to see. Lemon's dog ran ahead out of sight and suddenly began barking, returning moments later with its tail between its legs. After reaching the top of the hill, the group reportedly saw a large pulsating ball of fire about 15 meters away. That's 50 feet for us Americans. They also noticed a pungent mist which made their eyes and noses burn. Lemon then noticed two small lights over to the left of the ball of fire, underneath a nearby oak tree. Shining his flashlight in their direction, he revealed a large creature that was reportedly around seven feet tall, with a black body and a dark, glowing face. Its head was long and shaped like a spade. It didn't have human eyes and was covered in what looked like a dark exoskeleton that resembled a shadowy dress. It was reported to have also had long, stringy arms, protruding from the front of its body with long, claw-like fingers. The creature began to glide towards them, emitting a shrill hissing noise, before changing direction and heading off towards the red light. The group fled in panic. Shortly after, a Mr. A. Lee Stewart, co-owner of the Braxton Democrat, a local newspaper, conducted a series of interviews with the witnesses and later returned to the site with Lemon, where he reported to have smelled a sickening burnt metallic odor still prevailing. Local Sheriff Robert Carr and his deputy Burnell Long searched the area separately but could not report on any trace of the encounter other than the smell. The next morning, Stewart returned to the site and discovered two elongated tracks in the mud, as well as traces of a thick black liquid. Based on the premise that the area had not been subjected to vehicle traffic for at least a year, he immediately reported the tracks as possible signs of a saucer landing. This was later debunked as likely belonging to a 1942 Chevrolet pickup truck driven by local Max Lockard, who had gone to search for the creature himself after hearing the news prior to Stewart's discovery. Afterwards, to 
two investigators, William and Donna Smith, with the Civilian Saucer Investigation, abbreviated to CSI, gathered numerous accounts from witnesses claiming to have experienced a similar phenomena. These accounts included the story of a mother and her 21-year-old daughter who claimed to have encountered a creature with the same appearance and odor a week prior to the September 12th incident. The encounter reportedly affected the daughter so badly that she was confined to Clarksburg Hospital for three weeks. They also gathered a statement from the mother of Eugene Lemon, in which she said that, at the approximate time of the crash, her house had been violently shaken and her radio had cut out for about 45 minutes. Another witness claimed to have seen a flying saucer taking off at 6.30 a.m. on September 13th, the morning after the creature was sighted. Afterwards, several members from the original party had reported that they'd been suffering from several symptoms which they believed to be related to their exposure to the mist that was coming from the creature. The symptoms included irritation of the nose, swelling of the throat, and Lemon reportedly suffered from vomiting and convulsions throughout the night, and had throat pains for several weeks afterwards. A doctor who treated several of the witnesses reported that their symptoms were similar to those of victims of mustard gas. However, similar symptoms can be found commonly in victims of hysteria, which can be experienced after suffering a traumatic event. One paranormal investigator from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, also abbreviated to CSI, concluded in his 2000 report that the circumstances surrounding the Flatwoods incident all had valid explanations. This man was Joe Nickel, known by some as the modern Sherlock Holmes, and famous for exposing the forgery of the purported diary of Jack the Ripper. He proposed that alleged alien encounters are the result of misinterpreted natural phenomena, hoaxes, and a fantasy-prone personality. Nickel concluded that the bright light seen in the sky on September 12th was likely a meteor, as on that same night, a meteor had been observed across the states of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, mistakenly reported as a crashing aircraft by observers approximately 11 miles southwest of the Flatwoods sighting. Nickel also proposed that the pulsating red light was likely an aircraft navigation beacon, as there were three visible from the area of the sightings, and finally, that the shape, movement, and sounds of the creature described by witnesses closely resembled what could have been a barn owl perched on a tree limb. Nickel went on to argue that the initial sighting of what was likely a meteor, although to the group a UFO, caused a heightened state of anxiety which led to a distorted view of what was to follow. A number of other investigators have reached the same conclusion, including the likes of the US Air Force. Skeptics have also proposed that sightings of another cryptid phenomenon known as the Mothman are based on similar experiences involving owls. Other theories range from the Flatwoods group witnessing the impact of a meteor, which had resulted in a man-shaped cloud of vapor, to bearing witness to some kind of covert government aircraft. This creepy phenomena has certainly sparked an interest in the local county of Braxton, where the town of Flatwoods is located. As of 2015, five 10-foot tall chairs in the monster's image have been erected in various towns across Braxton County in an effort to increase tourism. And they've worked. In 2016, Governor Earl Ray Tomlin officially declared September 12th as Monster Day, and today, there exists a new adventure tour campaign in which participants are challenged to document each monster chair scattered around Braxton in an effort to prove the existence of the monster that has been nicknamed Braxy. And in Japanese UFO culture, the influence of Braxy can be found in various video games and media, the likes of which include Amagon for the NES and the anime series Sergeant Frog. But other than in the media, Real sightings of the Flatwoods monster have not been reported since the original events in 1952. So what do you think? Is the Flatwoods monster real? Whether you choose to believe or not is entirely up to you. The world is a vast and mysterious place, and there is what seems to be an infinite plethora of the world left for us to explore. Though we may fear the unknown, we live every day to better learn and understand these fears, and in doing so, we may gain a better insight into understanding ourselves. As always, thank you for watching, and good night. And the comment of the week goes to Immunity Zero, who says, I've always imagined the Sandman to be a being that protects you from other entities, or any other being that means to do you harm, while controlling your dreams to the extent of either giving you good or bad dreams with varying levels of each. Also, you are amazing in all that you do. Thank you, Blue. 
thank you for the kind words, Immunity Zero. Um, I looked at your channel and I saw that you produce uh, narration content and creepy narration content. So I think that's awesome. Keep keep uh, living the dream. Um, and for all my viewers watching, if you want to check out his channel, I'll leave a link to it in my um, description down below, and you can check him out there. If you like what you see, definitely subscribe. Thanks again for watching, everyone. Click on the left painting to watch last week's episode of The Grim Gallery. Click on the right painting to access my Darkology playlist. To receive updates about episodes, be sure to follow me on Twitter and Facebook. My name is BlueLava6, and as always, I will see you in the next video.